So first to present myself, I'm John Santos. I'm a software engineer at Zalando as part of the continuous delivery and deployment team. And today I'm going to present the path we took at Zalando from the dark ages of subversion to the enlightened age of autonomous work with JIT. So some quick facts about Zalando so you understand um, the context of my work. Uh, we, are, we have our headquarters in Berlin. Um, we have also other offices in other places like Dublin, Helsinki, Dortmund, Erfurt. We have more than 700, actually nowadays almost 1,000 engineers. And we do lots of, every, almost everything we do is done in-house, so we do lots of de development. Okay, so the first question when talking about Git hooks is why do we need Git hooks in or subversion hooks or other kinds of commits hook in the first place? The answer to this is to enforce rules. Th this raises the second question. Why do we need rules? Any large group or organization needs rules. Um, some rules are internal to the groups, some are external and they are very important to achieve an efficient workflow to ensure quality and transparency to, uh, to all stakeholders. And in case of Salando, stakeholders go from the colleague at, um, at the deck, um, next deck, desk, desk to the customer that uh, has trusted as his credit card to in the investor who spent lots of his money and he trusted and believed in us. Second question is how we enforce rules. Not all rules are enforced in Git hooks. Some rules are enforced bef before deployment. Some rules are only monitored, are not enforced. Um, so you have to look at your workflow and see what rules can be enforced a priori or with checks and what rules can be checked uh, after the, you have moved on your workflow. It's vital to keep a proper balance between two types of enforcements because if you have too many blockers on your workflow, you prevent your developers uh, from, or, uh, from being productive, but if you have too few checks and blockers, you risk that bad software goes live and you break the trust all stakeholders that in you. So now starting point, dark ages of subversion. This is, was the place where you, we were when I arrived at Salando two years ago. We had one bash script with some basic checks, with, uh, a pre-commit hook. Then we were growing as a company and we needed more rules because, because it was not possible for someone to keep track of everything that was happening. So and it was not possible to keep a bash script anymore. It was not efficient, it was not maintainable, so we ported the, git to the um, subversion com commit hook from bash to Python. Um, around December 2000, 2013, we start moving from git because subversion was not good enough for us anymore, and we had to do something uh, so we started moving to Git. Uh, we still had the same rules in place as before, and we knew we would still keep a subversion from some, for some time because we already had lots of teams, and some teams wanted to move faster and others slower, and not everyone wanted to move to Git, so we had to convince everyone, and we decided to do a migration in waves. So our first the first decision we took was to adapt the SVN commit hook to work on both SVN and Git. Uh, so we implemented um, Git hook as a progressive hook because it, it's invoked at, at the same point on the workflow as the commit hook on subversion. This is when the user sends changes to the remote server and because it allowed us to reject the reference or branch without rejecting the full push. The other alternative would be to an update to hook, but in that one, if you return an error code, it will block the full push even if most of it is um, following the rules. Um, doing this had some problems. This approach had some problems. So the first, the first, problem, the first problem in this plan was that Git is not subversion. There are different 
they are different in fundamental ways and they and trying to support both would mean separate support for both of them. Um, the other problem is that being distributed, Git is more flexible than subversion, which means that people don't use Git the same way they use subversion and they you don't use Git same in the same way that other people use Git. Um, the first things that, even the first things that allowed to, to migrate to Git uh, start experimenting different workflows and this was a good thing because they were very different projects and different projects have very different requirements. Uh, so it, it makes sense for them to have a different set of best practices and slightly different rules and different branching strategy. But this also forces us to rethink how we uh, check the rules and how we implement the rules and we had to rethink the Git rules. So we moved to plan B, uh, where before we had one, one common hook for Git and subversion, uh, now we, we decided to have two different hooks. In practice, this, me this meant we forked the hook in two. Um, the subversion commit hook was deprecated, so no more changes there because we don't want this to really support the subversion anymore. And we continued to work on the Git pre receive hook because different teams wanted to use different workflows, uh, we moved away from the one size fits all strategy and allowed teams to specify a set of rules for, for themselves. Uh, so this is the way we allow teams to set rules for themselves. We have um, a configuration format based on YAML where stash projects and repositories could mesh um, several rule sets by name uh, this is similar um, uh, to CSS, so for example, you can see there that uh, one team could have one general rule for themselves, for their project, but, uh, but for a specific repository, they could change uh, part of the rules and not the whole set. And uh, a second team could have a completely different rule set because they have different needs. The problem with this second approach, and this was a re reflection we did after using the, um, this Git hooks for one year, was that we had a centralized configuration which became a bottom, bottleneck because it could only be changed by a small number of people, and sometimes we were all on vacation and it was really bad. Um, other more technical problem we had is that we were trying to check all the commits on a push because ru some rules apply to every single commit. Uh, for example, we checked that we, one of the rules we, had as a, we have at Zalando is that every com commit message has to have a ticket and for this we have to go through all commits and this uh, was problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, for example, uh, Git history is not linear. So if the user merges or rebases from a branch and we try to check all the messages in the commit range for ticket ID and see if it matches to a branch, branches that came from, uh, commits that came from other branches by the rebase or the merge would fail this check. Uh, in the end we tried to um, several solutions, some worked way better than others. In the end the solution for this was uh, filtering out um, commits that were already in a branch because this meant they were already checked before and didn't belong, uh, were not originated on this branch. Second uh, problem we had is that uh, when you merge to or from a long-lived branch, some teams uh, for had some very long-lived uh, projects and they had branches for it and sometimes they deferred from master for two, three months, and when they merged from master or to master or when they rebased, they had literally hundreds of commits to check. Um, because of some of our checks took some time, we had pushes that took more than half an hour to check, and this was not a good experience for our developers. Uh, related to this, uh, and one of the slowest checks we had is uh, checking code style, especially for Java code because we use, you, we use Jalopy to validate code style and it runs on JVM. And uh, the architecture of our code validator meant we had to spawn one JVM for every changed file. 
So if someone pushed uh, 200 changed files, we would spawn up 200 JVMs and other people were pushing at the same time and it uh, was con uh, constantly fr freezing and slowing down our server. We were able to mitigate this problem by using Nailgant that, um, that is a kind of server that keeps a JVM alive and you can run um, uh, JVM programs there and we could run Jalopy there but we had to do some workarounds to run Jalopy par uh, in parallel and we, we still had some performance issues when there, for some reason there were more pushes than usual. The last problem of this, of this is that this system was inflexible. Uh, sometimes people have very good reasons to ignore rules. Some, sometimes they pushed something to not, that they didn't want to push and they want to do a force push and we didn't allow that. Sometimes they, sometimes some push was accepted by mistake and it was a bug and it has to be removed because it should not be there. Uh, sometimes there's a bug and we rejected something that we should have accepted and um, because uh, this was on our server and people didn't have access to the server that they had no way to go around this. The other, pro the other way we were inflexible is that because it's a remote git hook and it's living on the server, we only supported our internal git uh, server. Uh, for example, you could not use uh, um, our git hook for our projects on github.com. And so our open source projects were completely unsupported. Uh, in the end, we, I could um, summarize all these problems that as we try to centralize Git. While Git is distributed, we still saw our source control management system as, as centralized because we came from subversion and we were still thinking like subversion. But it was clear that we would have to rethink our approach. This process of thinking about the Git hooks coincided with a huge change that is Lando as part of something we call radical agility. Uh, Zalando was getting rid of all the hierarchies and giving teams more autonomy and one of the new motors was autonomy instead of control. And this presented a clear path for us and uh, in the end was the solution uh, that we are still implementing. So we decided to move away from remote git hooks uh, to, lo uh, to a set of local git uh, from remote git hooks to a set of local git hooks. Uh, one advantage of this is that Git hooks see one commit at a time, so we avoided the issues where we had a set, a list of commits to check, and we didn't know what was a, what came from a merge or a rebase and what was created in the branch. And it's better adjusted to the distributed nature of Git because they are distributed by themselves and people run it on their local machines. We decided that they should be optional because we want to test people. Uh, this also means that Git hooks are no longer responsible for enforcing the rules. Instead, we are creating mechanisms to ensure uh, that um, all level, lev development follows the rules before the code goes live, but we don't block anyone from pushing anything right now. Uh, we did this because we believe Git hooks should be seen as a tool to help autonomous developers and, and not as a barrier that makes their work harder. We decided to make them extensible because as I said before, one size doesn't fit all. Different teams have different needs and some, sometimes um, we only have a small group of developers working on this more or less full time and, but sometimes people have other ideas and they can implement new stuff for themselves. Sometimes they, they don't want one of our checks so, and they don't want to install the dependencies of our checks. So by being extensible, they can opt out of the, those dependencies. And we decided to make it open source because by only being and thinking open source, it could fully support autonomous teams. And this also allowed us to support our teams that want to open source their code. And this also includes my team. So our, uh, our new set of hooks that we call Turnstyle are available on, Git, uh, on GitHub and by API, so everyone is free to use them. So if you want to install it on your machine, you can just use pip install turnstile core. This will just install core without any of 
any of any of our uh, extensions. We also have some extensions on Zalando's GitHub account. So, and now you, you want to use it on your repository. What do you have to use? Well, the first step, this is a uh, turnstile uh, YAML file in the root of your repository. If you use something like Travis CI or, or something similar, it's same pro the same process, you just add it, a file to your repository. And it looks something like this. You have a list of checks you want to use. So you just name them and you can give options to all checks that they support by themselves. And every check, if you, even if you are implementing your own check as a, an extension, you can read this file and you have access to it. So, uh, and because the way um, local git hooks work, uh, you need to symlink the hooks on your .git folder inside the repository. And to make this easy, uh, turnstyle supports a subcomment that's turnstyle installed that will automatically symlink to hooks for you and because I was already adding support for subcommands, I added several more. We have to config subcommand that right now the only thing it does is set, uh, allow you to set verbosity. So if you want only to see errors, you can only see the errors. If you want to see everything that turnstyle is doing behind the scenes, you can also do it. You, we have to install command to add the hooks to a specific repository. We have to remove if you decide to, not, if you don't want the hooks anymore for that repository. Uh, the specification uh, subcommand is used for a check if, if a t um, all your projects contain a valid specification, of all your commits contain a valid specification and right now this means um, a new, uh, if they start with a new URL, but I'm planning to support more stuff in the near future. Uh, the upgrade subcommand will check PyPI to see if turnstyle and all, or, all your extensions are updated and if they are not, it will offer to update everything for you and the version just prints the version and it's not that interesting. So now if you want to create extensions to turnstyle, how can you do it? Um, the, uh, the way you, you do it is with um, set of tools um, entry points. So you just have, uh, if you want to add a comment, you just uh, go to the, uh, use the entry point turnstyle.comments. You give the name of your sub comment and this will be used to call it from the comment line and you just provide the module where your sub comment is and I, uh, you can see more on documentation later. It's the same thing for checks. Uh, so if you want to check something with, a, uh, with the pre-commit hook, we use, you also give it a name that will be used on the configuration and you, s you provide the module that's going to be used. So you have, we have three entry points right now, one for commands, one for commit message hook that checks commit message, and the other for the pre-commit hook that, that we use for checking code style, for example. So what we, did we learn from this process? First, don't, and this is the most important, don't get stuck in the past. It's very easy to make mistakes because it was always done like this. Um, what was the best solution yesterday can be the wrong solution today. And this will, be most li li will most li likely be true if you change technologies. Because if you change technologies, you will have different uh, limitations and different opportunities and you should re you should rethink what you're doing and adapt to it. Other, uh, one other thing we learned was to develop in the open because this, by being more transparent about w what we wanted, where we, we, are, we were going, uh, we avoided um, assuming too much and we, uh, um, and we avoided backing ourselves into a corner and we got early feedback that also avoided lots of issues. Uh, we also learned that we should build tools, not barriers. Software is meant to help people and be more, to be more productive. If your software is making people lose time instead of saving time, uh, you should rethink it. 
Um, by rethinking our gate hooks, we were able to move from a position where sometimes uh, our, our software was hindering uh, the productivity of our engineering teams to a position where they are useful tools to help them work autonomously. Uh, so, any question? Uh, there's one question there. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. My question is about the, um, the cost and the effort of any change, because some, you were talking about your company can, can changing. You, can you speak louder? I, I cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, now? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you. I was uh, asking about the effort of changing in each step, because sometimes, okay, leaving subversion may be a good thing, but changing for centralized hooks to local hooks and everything, about the effort. Yes, um, yes, it's an art process, and we are still working on it. Uh, some teams, uh, and actually, are doing things where we are disabling checks on the remote hook in phases and uh, telling people now start using this and we are trying to make it compatible uh, so uh, the only thing that's not working same uh, same way on the remote git hooks and local git hooks is specification because before we only allowed um, people to use gyra tickets and uh, now because teams are autonomous we want to allow them to use whatever solution they want so now we support more stuff uh, uh, fortunately, at Zalando, we were, are already used to um, always question everything, and is one of our philosophy. Uh, if we, if you stay, if you are doing the same thing all the time, you should question yourself and see if it's not there's no better way to do it. And it, 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 it's part of our corporate culture, and it, that that doesn't mean that people don't co don't complain that we are changing again and that we have to manage it, but. At, at least in relation, relationship to this, I, m most feedback I, I have is that people are happy to be able to control um, when they use the hooks, how they use it, uh, and, and uh, they don't. And they are very happy that they don't have re to rely on me and my team to change a uh, step for them. You can provide any samples of the kind of rules you are enforcing with that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, for example, and this is actually from one of uh, our open source repositories. I don't remember exactly what. Uh, this is a very minimum set. Uh, we have more than that. But, for example, this specification, we have the specification check. What it does right now, uh, is uh, checking if um, uh, your commit message starts with an URL and uh, you have the option allowed schemes right now and I'm saying that I only accept HTTPS URLs because on this case all um, specifications are done using GitHub issues. Uh, in the near future I want also to support, to support GitHub references so you can just the, the, the references that are supported by GitHub and also uh, Jira ticket IDs because we still use it at Zalando and we wanted to make it easy for people to use it. Uh, we have the branch release check that in this case uses that regex expression on the bottom to check if a branch that starts with release slash uh, something, the second part has to match that one. In this case, it has to start with a V and follow some rules. That's the format we use at Zalando, but you can use whatever you want. And uh, to protect master branch, in this case, uh, forbids you to commit directly to master because we I want to enforce uh, pull requests. Uh, any other questions? No questions from anybody? Okay, uh, just uh, just one more thing. 
Um, if you want to find uh, uh, more information about Zalando, um, we have a tech blog on tech.zalando.com. We have our GitHub page, uh, github.com slash Zalando. We have lots of open source projects there and we are going to have much more in the future. We also have Twitter, Instagram, and Instagram account and a jobs page. And um, when, uh, one of my colleagues will give a, pre a presentation in the recruiting session uh, later today. Thanks.